Now, for more on the health of the global tourism industry, I'm joined by TravelPulse.com founder Mark Murphy. Welcome back to the show. Always good to be here. Thanks. So, Mark, which countries are seeing the biggest boom in tourism and why? Well, you mentioned China growing rapidly, um, India growing rapidly, um, you know, Indonesia, places like that are growing rapidly and are going to be on the large end, ones that are going to be uh, big, um, you know, they're, they're going to just continue to grow with uh, the advent of more and more people wanting to get out and explore the world. Uh, on the other hand, some of the smaller destinations that have been big tourism draws like Egypt have seen rapid growth in the last year or so because they became depressed because of a variety of reasons. In the case of Egypt, it had to do with the uprising and the revolution and then some of the terrorist incidents that took place and the downing of the Russian jetliner uh, over Sharm el-Sheikh. Those things have impacted it. So even though Egypt is growing rapidly, it's still down from its peak, you know, uh, several years ago in the late, uh, you know, first decade of this century. So that, that's what you're, you're starting to see. Stalwarts like Vietnam are continuing to grow rapidly, more than 30 percent. Iceland growing rapidly, uh, more than 34 uh, percent last year. So you're seeing this continued growth because people are discovering new places and new experiences. And I really like Iceland uh, for that as well. Now, speaking of Iceland, we saw that a recent article in the Wall Street Journal showed how they've obviously had this huge tourism boom in Iceland, but at oh, some yeah. point it can be to a detriment. What is that tipping point where too many tourists end up putting a strain on a country? I think when they put up the don't enter sign, that's probably the end of it. But uh, no, it's, it, Iceland is still open. The, the challenge, I think, what happens to the local economy is it impacts things like housing prices, so uh, apartment rentals. Because if a landlord is renting an apartment for somebody year round and they find that they can quadruple their income by renting it out for two and three nights at a time on Airbnb, then they're going to do that and they're going to take advantage. And that lowers the housing supply and you have the same demand or more demand. So therefore, the price goes up. So it makes it more difficult for the folks that live there to be able to enjoy you know, Reykjavik uh, their hometown, for instance, and that's, that's where it really negatively impacts the locals. What you'll find is as the demand booms, and I think it caught Iceland by surprise, they did an amazing job building up their tourism, but they didn't have the infrastructure and the hotel building can't keep pace with the kind of growth that they've seen in the last six or seven years. It will eventually catch up and then it'll give the rest of the market a breather and I think you'll see prices and um, the rest of the, uh, the issues they're currently having kind of dissipate. Now, turning in another direction, let's look at the U.S., which has actually seen a decline in tourist figures this yep. year. But how much of that can be chalked up to the Trump administration's policies as opposed to some other factors? Well, I think the actual policies that inhibit travel, they're, they're a non-event for travel. Now, did they create publicity that was negative that may have kept people away. Some of the airfare search engines, et cetera, showed dramatic declines in searches for travel to the U.S. on the heels of the initial uh, travel ban and on an ongoing basis. In my opinion, and I think a lot of economists would agree with this, the biggest driver has been the strength of the dollar. As the U.S. became less competitive from a price standpoint for, let's say, a European traveler or a Canadian traveler, they are voting with their dollars, and that Canadian traveler who may have gone to Florida may now jump over and go to Cuba instead and spend a week there as opposed to a week in Florida. So that the economy is really what drives it. And I'll just give you an example. People after a terrorist incident or some type of natural disaster, they will get back out and start traveling when the price comes down to create such a value that the fear, let's say, of terrorism gets blown away, literally and metaphorically, because now it's such a great value to go to a certain place, right. they're just going to go. And I, I find that an interesting, you know, psychological uh, experiment when it comes to travel. And so speaking of some of the devastation, we know that regionally here in the U.S. with um, hurricanes Irma and Maria, yeah. for some of these places that were key tourism places like Puerto Rico, what can they do to bounce back? What are other examples that they can look to to really bring the tourism industry back once they get on their feet? Well, I think everyone knows that the Caribbean always has hurricanes. Mexico has been hit with hurricanes. Of course, the U.S., uh, not, not so much in the last uh, 
12 years or so. However, what happens is, if you look at Puerto Rico, it's an infrastructure issue, right? So they have no electricity. There's a whole infrastructure issue that needs to get um, fixed. That's going to take months and months and months to get everything back online. At the same time, uh, if you look at a destination like Barbuda, it's completely destroyed. So again, it's going to be a rebuild from the ground up. So depending on the degree, I think when you have resorts and destinations that get impacted and heavily impacted, where their beach gets blown away or their um, building gets uh, dramatically affected, right. you'll find that two, three months, those resorts are back online. It's, it's almost miraculous how fast um, they can get out there and get back in the game. And I've seen that over and over and over again just last year with Jamaica. Right. Uh, we were supposed to film film in Jamaica. We got delayed a few months. We went down and we looked around. It was as if nothing had happened, although we had to get delayed for a few months because of uh, some damage from some storms that had hit them. Now, Mark, I do want to get to some of the new types of tourism that you're seeing. What's starting to materialize and what might we be talking about a year from now? Well, you know, it, it all comes down to experiences. So what, what are people trying to do? They're trying to get out and experience culture. So you're going to find more and more people dining with locals, let's say, in a destination where the local's home is opened up and the traveler can get access to that experience. And there are companies that will set that up for you and create that experience as part of a, let's say, a trip to Jordan. You may dine with a local uh, uh, Jordanian family, and then you might also go out and see Petra and do all the experiences. Um, that's what people are looking for. They want to go out into the desert, and they want to get to a, um, like a tented uh, area where there's this luxurious tent structure. They can go experience that. They can experience an oasis. They can take a Jeep way out into the desert and you know take dune buggies and other experiences like that and that's happening in places like mexico outside los cabos it's happening in dubai right. it's happening you know all over the world and so somebody wants to come back with what they call bragging rights and that can be any number of things and in china i experienced something many years ago which was a vip experience where i could handle artifacts three thousand year old artifacts and it was capped the number of people that could do that that's what people are seeking out and many of the things we're going to be talking about next year have yet to be discovered this year, which is kind of interesting and why I love travel. Well, certainly we'll give you bragging rights. Thank you so much, travel expert Mark Murphy and founder of TravelPulse.com.